Nat's trying to take this game to a level that's going to you know, go outside the comfort zone of a lot of these players. And I hope he really puts these loggers to the test. I want to see what they're all made of. Johnny, I think, played his opponent perfectly in this scenario. We had some people in the chat that were calling saying Johnny Vibes is going to just absolutely crush and kill this game. Right now, he is in the midst of crushing a session. I think Johnny really makes adjustments, well, not only to the board, but also to his player. Johnny is clearly, and this is coming from someone that's at the table, Johnny is clearly the best player at the table. Johnny Vibes, he's, he's feeling it. He's uh, putting people in tough spots. He's, uh, he's in the zone, for sure. He's got his own clothing line. He's got a vlog. He's, he's up like $3,000. <laughs> and he's got all the good energy, all the he's, good vibes. He's married. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's crushing looking, life. Looking good, feeling good. He DJs sometimes. <laughs> Hey, what's up, guys? I am in a Sacramento hotel room, and I know you guys are really going to enjoy this episode because a lot of poker today on a live stream, and we're playing with Andrew Nimi, Brad Owen, Jamin Burton, the Boski, all people that have more subscribers than I do. The other thing I wanted to mention before we get into today's episode is that it's my brother's birthday today. It's April 18th. My brother is super influential in my poker career. He is basically the reason that I'm still playing poker and he's the reason why I've been this successful at poker. And I gave him a big shout out on Instagram, but I want to do it on this video too because he's been so instrumental and in, in basically me creating the life that I have now. So I appreciate you so much, brother, and I love you and happy birthday. So let's get to the stones and let's get to battling. Let's win some money today. I'm playing poker with Brad Owen, superstar over there. Yeah. Andrew Nemi, the original gangster. He's actually in a hand right now. So playing the stones. All right, guys, I apologize for the low energy. I had just woken up, but let me tell you, I am super excited to narrate this episode. Let's get it started early on in the session when I was dealt King 10 suited in the cutoff. And it folded to me and I raised $35 and Nat flatted me on the button. When the flop came down, Jack Jack six with two spades. Obviously we flop a flush draw. I just decided to continue here with the King high flush draw. I think that there's so many cards that are gonna come on the turn that I can continue to barrel on. I could actually make my flush too. So not knowing anything about Nat, I just decide to bet and Nat makes the fold. All right, in this next hand, Nimi opens it up from early position with the ace nine of diamonds. And I look down at ace queen off suit, also in early position. And I just decide to flat here for $30. It actually invites a lot of callers. Five ways to a flop. When I flop a queen here on a spade board, possible straight draws, possible flush draws, and it checks to me, I am definitely gonna be betting for value here to narrow down the field. And everyone quickly folds around. So we're picking up momentum early on in the session. Before we started streaming, I had been pretty active with three betting as well. So I definitely have a fair amount of momentum here. The graphics say that I have 1200. I think that's approximately right. I bought in for a thousand. And I stole a couple of pots early on while Andrew was actually live streaming. I stole a pot with King nine off suit when I made a squeeze play preflop. So I think I'm actually gonna count the number of times I three bet and four bet in this session. So you guys can see exactly how aggressive I was. In this next hand, it folds to David in the cutoff and I look down at ace jack suited on the button. I decide to three bet this one. Like I said, I have been playing aggressive and I'm continuing the theme. Ace jack in position here, gonna three bet this one and isolate David's open. David seems to be playing pretty loose, so I think that he's gonna be calling me a lot here with a wide range. When the flop comes down, queen 10 six with two spades and no hearts, and he checks it over to me, I decide to check this one back because I think that this is going to hit David's calling range a fair amount of the time. When the four of heart comes on the turn and David elects to lead into me, I do have an overcard. I do have a gut shot, and I think that David can be betting with a lot of draws here. He can be taking a stab with a hand like King Nine. There's all types of hands that he would be taking a stab with here that I actually have beat. So I decide to make the call here. I think this is a pretty standard call in this three bet pot. When the river bricks off the four of clubs, this is something that I've talked about a lot. River board pairs are just not cards that people bluff on very often. So, I think that I'm leaning towards a fold here if David elects to bet again on the river. But luckily for us, David checks it and I'm more than happy to check it back. Like I said, I expect to win against hands like King Jack, King Nine, but we end up chopping. So not a bad result. 
So I think maybe one or two shuffles later, I look down at ace jack offsuit again. I'm actually in the cutoff. So actually this is the very next shuffle. And Nat is on the button with nine deuce offsuit and he three bets me. Mind you, I know nothing about Nat. All I know is that I'm in the cutoff and Nat is on the button and that's all I know. And I don't know anything about his history. I don't know if he's loose. I don't know if he's tight, but I just have a feeling like I mentioned before that he's going to be the type that's going to be mixing it up. So I take ace jack here and I make a four bet and Nat lays it down, obviously only having nine deuce off suit. If I could see the cards, I definitely would be four betting again. But like I said, this is actually really tough. A lot of people are not putting ace jack in their four betting range here, but there's just something about the energy that he had where I just felt like ace jack was going to be a four bet for value hand. And it turns out it was because he had the nine deuce and let it go. About five hands later, I look down at four five suited in the small blind after Nimi raises it up from late position and David calls on the button. And I thought about three betting this hand, but because I've been so active three betting, I just decided to play a pot with David and I thought that there was a good chance that Nat would be calling as well. So I think four five suited is definitely a great hand to play multi-way. It's pretty easy to play because you're not going to be getting involved too often unless you flop a big hand, which is exactly what happened. We flopped trip fours with two hearts on the board and I go ahead and check it over because I do not have the lead in this hand and Nat bets out into the field and it folds back to me and I don't want to spring the trap yet because... I think that Nat is going to have a lot of draws here. He's going to have some bluffs here as well. So I just decided to call. When the turn comes, the queen of spades, and now it puts two spades on the board. I check it over to Nat again, and he bets $100, which is a rather small sizing. So I think that he has a 10 here a lot, or I think that he possibly has a 10 with a spade in it, or he possibly has a heart draw, and he's setting his own price here. So with trip fours, I decide that I'm going to put some more money in the pot and raise it up with trips here just in case he's drawing. I want to build a pot and charge him for his draws. So when I make it 375 and he snap calls, snap call is often a tell that the other person has a draw. So like I said, I think he's going to have a draw a lot here. And when the perfect card comes on the river, the five of hearts, I really think that this is a spot where he's going to have a flush a lot. So because of that reason, and knowing that everyone is going to be value betting a flush here, I decided to check it over to him and allow him to bet. He has around 1700 left, and I actually cover him because I rebought to 2000 So when I check it over to him and he's thinking about it, I'm expecting a bet in the 500 to $600 range, and my plan is to check raise all in, but he overbet jams, 1700 effective and I obviously make the snap call with the full house here and much to the dismay of Nat he was going for super thin value he was also going for the jugular here by shipping it all in with the flush knowing that I have a four unfortunate for him that I have the full house with the five on the river there's actually nothing that he can do about it the only thing that he could maybe do to save some chips here is to bet a standard sizing on the river and then fold to my all-in but given the way Nat plays and given what I see later on in the session, I realized that an all-in here is not actually a bad play from him because he's the type of player that could be turning hands into bluffs. And if he's going to be bluffing, he's going to be bluffing for an all-in sizing. Nat immediately rebuys for 2500 So at this point, I can tell based on the way that Nat played the previous hand, based on how much he rebought for, that he is coming after me. He is going to want to play some pots with me. And given that he's on my direct left, I expect to get a lot of action from Nat here on out. So I am drinking, I'm having a great time, obviously, because I'm doing really well. And it's easy to have a great time when you're winning a lot and everyone is folding when you don't have anything. And then when you do have something, they're putting it all in. Obviously, it's it's easy to feel great, but I'm drinking beer and I look down at pocket aces and I don't skip a beat, immediately grab my chips, throw in three $25 chips, raise it up to $85, and Nat, who limped under the gun, calls me, which is something that I expected. So we end up going heads up to the flop, and I see an ace in the door card, and then an ace comes on the next card, so we have quad aces. And when I have quad aces, you can see how natural I look. Just like I expected it to happen, I just fire out 
$50 here, a continuation bet. But I size down because he's never really gonna have anything in this spot, but he snap raises me. And when he snap raises me, I honestly, I just can't contain myself. I lift my hand up off the felt and I show Andrew and I show Brad and I say, wow, I have quad aces and he's raising me. This is awesome. I basically say that out loud, but I know that Nat can't hear me because he's on the other side of the table. I genuinely am excited that he's raising me when I have quad aces because it means that he's bluffing all the time. I really don't have any options but to call. So I had to make the call and the jack of hearts comes on the turn. I check it over to him again and he really quickly puts in $300. Obviously I have no choice here but to call. He can't have pocket jacks. He can't have pocket eights. He can't have an ace because I have all of the aces. So he's bluffing. He would have raised those hands pre-flop, eights and jacks. And when the river comes a queen, I check it over to him again and he fires again, 600 quickly. Obviously I have to raise because I have the nuts, I have quads. Sizing doesn't really matter because he's not gonna have anything. On the off chance that he has king 10, which would be absolutely amazing, I'm just gonna stick it in there and hope that he does have king 10. Obviously, I'm just expecting him to fold here. So when I stick it in, I'm obviously very confident about my hand. I take a sip of beer. I know that he's gonna be folding and that he's just saving face here. But what one thing that's really interesting that happens is he goes, I don't know what to do with my ace deuce here. And I don't really know what to say when he says that. I go, I don't think you have ace deuce. <laughs> and that's when I take a sip of my beer and he goes, I do have ace deuce, do you wanna make a side bet on it? And I think about it for a second, and well, do I really wanna make a side bet on this? Because it would be a way for me to win back some money because if he holds strong and actually side bets me here, I'll win some money on the side. So I finally say, sure, I'll make a side bet with you that you don't have ace deuce here. And he gets quiet for a second when he realizes that I'm serious about side betting him and he goes, okay, you're right, I don't have ace deuce. And the whole table erupts in laughter he ends up making the fold and I just show the pocket aces and I go, that was the easiest side bet of my life because I know that you can't have an ace in this spot because I have four of them. So it was a really funny hand and definitely have some laughs about it. And Nat is taking this really well. He's a good sport about it. He realizes that I'm not laughing at him. It's just one of those hands that just really funny and he, he sees the humor in it as well. Nat is, you can tell he's just the type of guy that likes to have fun at the poker table. And I, I love playing with those types of guys. And honestly, if I'm not running great, he's going to be a nightmare to play with on my left because he obviously has heart as evidenced by the 4-3 suited in this last hand. So a couple hands later, I look down at 10-8 suited in late position, unopened to me, and I raise it up to $35. Stephen Y defends out of the small blind with jack-8 suited, and the flop comes queen-jack-9, and I flop a straight. So... Like I said, running great. Steve checks it over to me and I'm gonna continuation bet. It's gonna hit a lot of his flatting range out of the blinds. So I think he's gonna have a lot of pairs, pairs plus straight draws. So when I bet the flop $50 and he calls and the ace of spades comes on the turn, I think this is a great spot to continue again because I think that he's gonna pick up a lot of flush draws on the turn and this is actually gonna make him a lot of two pairs. So I think that he's gonna be continuing a lot here. So I put in another bet and he quickly folds Unfortunately, he had the portion of his range that did not hit the ace and did not pick up a flush draw. But that's okay, I can't complain about flopping a straight and winning the hand. At this point, the graphics are actually starting to become correct. I actually do have in the neighborhood of 5,500 after this hand. All right, in this next hand, I am in the straddle and I look down at king six off suit. Andrew Nimi completes from the small blind and David makes a really small sizing from the big blind considering he's out of position on me and he makes it 50, 5X, which I read into it as a marginal strength hand. So I'm gonna take the initiative here and three bet and isolate him. So I make it $220 with king six off suit. Like I said, I'm just playing in flow right now, just kind of reading that he has a marginal strength hand and thinking that I'm gonna win this hand the majority of the time if I take the lead here. So when I make it 220 and David ends up making the call, and we flop great, flops king eight three rainbow. When he checks it over to me and I have top pair here, I think that this is definitely not a three street hand against David and he's gonna be missing this board fairly often. He's not gonna have any draws either. So I don't think there's too much point in betting on the flop. So I decide to check and trap and keep in his bluffs in case he wants to turn his hand into a bluff. 
So when the turn comes, the queen of diamonds, although there isn't any flush draws out there, I want to start going for value here with my top pair because I think that now he's going to have more hands that can call a bet, hands that contain a queen, hands that are draws now, hands like 9-10, hands like jack-10. So I bet $200, around 40% pot, and David thinks about it for a while, and he elects to make the check raise here. And I think that I have the best hand all day here. I don't think that he is ever going to have me beat here. I don't think that he ever has pocket queens because he probably would just would have re-raised me pre-flop. I don't think he has pocket eights because he probably would have led the turn. I don't think he has ace king because he would have raised me pre-flop. I don't think that he has king queen because I think he probably would have just led on the turn. I don't think that he ever has me beat here. So... I am just going to lay the trap here. I think that actually he's going to be weighted more towards hands like ace 10 or ace jack. And when the jack comes on the river and there's 1700 in the pot and he has around $600 left, when he checks it over to me, I think that he just gave up on his bluff. I don't think that he really has anything here. So I think that the best thing to do is to check it back. I thought about actually betting all in here because I just didn't want to show that I had king six offsuit. And I thought that he would just be folding everything since he didn't have anything. So this is the very next shuffle after the king six offsuit hand. Andrew raises it up from the button with eight three suited. And I look down at king 10 suited in the big blind. Like I said, I've been very active three betting preflop. So... With this hand, I just decide to take a flop here, mix it up a little bit. I'm definitely going to be three betting sometimes, but with the game flow and how often I'm three betting, the fact that I three bet with King Sucks off suit, the shuffle before, I decide to play in flow and flat with the King 10 suited here. Nat on my left in the straddle ends up three betting to $120. And when Andrew quickly makes the fold here, and I have King 10 suited, a Royal Flush Draw with 6K behind and Nat having over 3K. The graphics are a little wrong there. It says he has 2.4K, but he has around 3K in this hand. I am going to be playing pots with Nat, so I elect to make the call here. So when the flop comes Jack 10 6 with two spades, we flop a pair. I'm going to be going into check call mode here against Nat because of the way that he plays and the fact that I flopped a pair. So it's definitely a good board for me. It's a good flop for me. And I think Nat recognizes that and he ends up checking this one back. When the deuce of heart comes on the turn and I check it over to him again, Nat ends up going for value and rightfully so. He has second pair with the ace kicker. But like I said, I have second pair with the king kicker and this is definitely not a spot that I'm going to be folding. When the five of spades comes on the river and I check, I think that I might have to check call a large percentage of the time here because I don't think that Nat is going to be checking back a flush draw. Luckily for us, he checks it back and we don't have to go in the tank on the river and it goes check, check, and we end up losing a small pot here. So this is actually two shuffles later. I am now on the button and Nimi opens it up from the hijack with a seven of clubs and I look down at ace queen off suit. And I'm on the button. And this is obviously a spot where I should be three betting. So I three bet it. I have been a three betting maniac. So I don't think I'm going to get a lot of credit here in general. So I decide to three bet it. My hand is really high up on the charts for value here. And when it folds back to Andrew and he puts in the four bet and he only has about 1300 to start the hand and he makes it $295. He has $1,000 left. I'm not exactly sure what to do here. I know that folding ace queen off suit is not an option in this spot. Not with the game flow, not with how much I've been three betting, not with these positional dynamics, but I don't exactly want to shove it all in because I don't think that Andrew's ever going to call off with worse than ace queen. So I like to make the call here and play a pot. I don't really love this play, but I think it's slightly better than moving all in. It's not often that you're going to be five bet shipping it with ace queen for value. I was actually in the booth for this hand, so I'm going to let the audio from the booth take over in this hand. And even though I'm a little buzzed, I think I still do a decent enough job of breaking down the hand. On jack 10-5, he checks it over to you. And actually, so this, this board texture is going to be better for my hand than it is going to be for his hand. And I decided to check it back because I think that Andrew actually can be trapping here too. I think he can be trapping with a hand like aces or kings. 
So, but when he checks out a, a second time, I don't have the Ace of Spades or the Queen of Spades in my hand. And I just decided to check it back. I think this is actually a mistake. I think that I should, I actually considered betting all in here, over betting all in and putting it into the test. But I look at this, 97%. How am I going to lose this hand? 97%. Is that a spoiler? <laughs> <laughs> the five times and pairs the board. And on river board pairs, I just don't expect Andrew to be bluffing very often. So I actually expect a check here, and I, I'm going to check back, and I'm going to expect to chop, or to lose the ace king, or to lose to, or to win to a hand like a7, but Andrew has heart, and he decides that I have absolutely nothing, and he's going to take a stab here, and he bets half pot. I don't know if you, I don't know if people can hear, but what I'm talking about is I asked, I said, I wanted you to check here. I wanted you to check so that I could win the hand or that I could check or that I could chop. What I wanted to do is check and then I win or I chop. That's what I'm saying here. <laughs> but now that you're betting, I don't think I win. I think that maybe you slow play to hand like kings or have something that you're trying to get value with. So I just decided to lay the ace queen down and Andrew gets one over on me. All right, in this next hand, Missouri Steve limps in early position with the ace three off suit, and David raises it up from the button to $30. And I think that David is going to be isolating Steve's limp pretty wide here. And I look down at the ace seven off suit in the small blind. And like I said, I've been playing very aggressive pre flop. I elect to make the three bet here. I have the ace blocker. And I think that, like I said, David is going to be pretty wide here, so I make it 150 and everyone quickly folds and we take down another pot. Okay, in this next hand, I look down at ace 10 off suit in the hijack and David raises it up to $35 in front of me. And true to my aggressive form in this game, I three bet it instantaneously up to 105. Nat over calls from the cutoff and Steven takes some pause here. He thinks about making a move with the ace five suited, but thinks better of it and lets it go. David ends up completing the action and calling, and we end up going three ways to a flop. The flop comes down queen, six, five, rainbow. And when it checks to me, I'm just going to continue to tell the story here. And I put out a C bet of $175, around half pot, and Nat makes the snap call. When David elects to fold, and I'm sitting here with ace high on this board in a spot where Nat snap called, and knowing that I feel the energy that he's going to try to bluff me at some point. When the seven of spades comes on the turn and it's on me now again, I'm out of position against Nat, like I said. I think that while this card is definitely better for his range, because of game flow reasons and because of the way that we've been playing and me checking and trapping him, I think this is a spot where I just want to barrel him off of his hand. I want to get him to fold better ace highs. I actually have no idea what he has, but... I decide to go for around 80% pot bet here and just use sheer aggression, use the game flow that's been going on and, and use a spot where it doesn't look like I'm gonna be bluffing very often. And Nat doesn't really have much, so he ends up folding. In this next hand, David raises it up to 30 and I look down at ace nine suited and I snap three bet him, true to form, snap three bet him from early position with the ace nine suited. And it folds over to Steven, the local from Sacramento, and he ends up overcalling. And when he overcalls, warning bells are going off in my mind because he has been playing super snug. So I don't think that I can do much here other than continue cautiously because Steve is going to have a very narrow range here. When David ships it all in, I obviously have no choice here but to fold because think that Steven is going to snap him off all day, which is what ends up happening. He has ace king and makes the snap call after David moves it all in. David ran it twice and was able to get half of his money back. So he still has around $700 to $800 when he limps into my straddle with king five suited. And I look down at ace jack off suit. I bump it up to $85, which obviously is a pretty big bet, but David obliges and makes the call. When the flop comes down, Jack 5-4 with two clubs, and he checks it over to me. I am just going to be going for value against David. I know that he's not going to be folding any piece here, and I have top pair. So I'm just going for three streets here. 
When David check calls me on the flop and the jack comes on the turn, I realize that this is a really great card for me, not only because I make trips, but because it makes it less likely for him to be folding his hand unless he happens to have a flush draw. But I do block the flush draw with the ace of clubs, so I think it's more likely that he has a straight draw or he has a five or a four in his hand. So when I bet the turn and he makes the call again, when the river comes to eight of clubs, it's obviously a bad card because a flush gets there and the only straight draw gets there too. Six, seven gets there. But when he checks it over to me and only leaves himself with four to five hundred dollars, I know that I have the best hand here with trip jacks and I just want to bet him all in because I want to give him the opportunity to make a mistake here to make a light call down. He's been very frustrated with me. I've been putting a lot of money in the pot so I could see him making a light hero call here. So I bet it all in and he thinks about it for a long time and he does make the discipline lay down. David has reloaded and he's now up to $1,000 when he opens a cutoff with Jack-8 suited. I look down at 6-5 suited on the button and I three bet again. It wasn't gonna stop here. I'm three beers deep and my image, I'm just running the table over. I'm not gonna stop three betting. I'm gonna continue to play like a madman. So I three bet it to $75. This is not a straddled pot and Nat overcalls from the blind. And David completes the action. When the flop comes down, eight, seven, three with two diamonds, and I flop an open under, and I flop a flush draw, checks to me, and I bet 100 into $230. Nat makes the call, and David now check raises for value because he has top pair. He check raises and makes it $335. At this point, because I have a draw, I do not want Nat to be continuing at all with a better draw. I don't want him to have higher diamonds or anything. So I decide to make it a huge sizing and I bet 4,000, enough to put both players all in. And luckily Nat just makes the fold. He didn't have a higher flush draw or anything like that. So when he makes the fold and David now goes into the tank for his last $550, I actually don't mind a fold here because he only has to put in another $500 to win around $1,500. So I'm fine with collecting the pot and having him fold. But either way, like I said, I have great equity here. I don't really care if he calls. I tell him right here while we're chatting it up that I am only going to run it once. I don't even remember what I'm saying. I'm obviously having a lot of fun at the table. I think what I remember telling him is that he did this to himself. He had the opportunity to check call but he decided to check raise and now he's in a spot like this and now I'm only going to run it once with him. So choose wisely. He thinks about it for a long time and he ends up making the fold, which is fine by me. It's actually more profitable for me if he makes the fold because I'm only 57% to win this hand and I win a sizable pot without showdown. So more than happy with his fold here. This next hand is actually really interesting because the straddle is on for Brad, he makes it 10. And then Nimi decides to double straddle and makes it 20. And then David decides to triple straddle and he makes it 40. And I decide to quadruple straddle and I make it 80. So David with a thousand bucks, he has around $900, looks down at his cards and immediately says, let's go and moves it all in. You can see how long it takes me to decide whether or not to call up $900 here. Let's see here. Look down at the ace. Look down at the 10. Snap call. With 10-9 off and getting I'm snap yes. call oh. by Johnny Bob. Oh, no. Michael oh, with the 10 oh. high again. That look. Oh my just, God. That look. So he's like, oh, I'm so dead. Again. I'm so dead, dude. He shows the 10. Oh he like doesn't even bother. Oh my God. Oh my God. Snapping him off. Uh oh, seven ball. Pray for a nine. Seven ball at running diamonds. <laughs> This game cannot be any more fun. Thank Let's get a sweat. Let's get a sweat. Thank God for overtime. Sweater diamond. Diamond ball. That's, oh, that's card. The exactly opposite of a sweat. What is happening? Oh my God, that one is really good. This next hand is actually super interesting because of some sizings that I use. I have around $8,000 and it folds to me in the cutoff and I have ace-king off suit. I go ahead and raise it up to a standard sizing of 35 and Nat three bets me on the button to 100. So it's a $65 raise and Steve actually overcalls the $100. So when it comes back to me and I am in the spot with a very high value hand in a spot where the button is gonna be three betting a lot and Steve K is actually gonna have a pretty good hand fairly often, 
I decide to make the four bet here, but I wanna use a really small sizing. So if Nat actually has a value hand and flats my four bet and Steve ends up jamming, the betting is still gonna be opened up to me because I used a small enough sizing to keep the betting open to me. It was something that I was very cognizant of when I chose my sizing. Nat actually just makes the fold regardless of my sizing and it turns out that it's a really great sizing because it allows Steve to call for a really small sizing now and leave himself with only $160. When the flop comes down queen eight three and he checks it over to me, I bet all in here, expecting to get called a fair amount of the time, but Steve ends up letting it go with 67% equity and only needing to donate about 20% to the pot to realize that equity. So it's a really great result for us. Okay, the last hand that I am gonna cover is a bomb pot. And the reason why I wanna cover this is because there's still some hand reading that goes on in this hand. I have the queen jack off suit when we go nine ways to a flop and the flop comes king queen three. I am out of position here so I check it and when it checks around, I think that I'm gonna have the best hand a lot here. When the seven comes on the turn and the board is completely rainbow, I wanna start going for value here with my queen. So I bet really small, I bet $50 into a pot of 225. I think it's enough to get the job done because like I said, nobody is gonna be able to hand read me and I can have pretty much anything here. And I think that this sizing will get action from worse hands. So when I bet $50 and it folds all the way around to David, I know that I'm pretty much gonna win all the time here because I don't think that David is ever gonna be checking a hand that can beat queen jack in this spot. So I'm expecting him to make the fold here. But when he decides to check raise and make it $200, this is such an easy call for me. I mean, he's just never gonna have me beat here. He's never gonna have a king because he's not gonna check it twice. He's never gonna have a queen because he's not gonna check it twice. Maybe he could have pocket sevens. Pocket sevens would be the one hand that he could check twice. But when the seven comes on the river, I don't think he has quads here. I'm just gonna be calling whatever he bets. I expect to pick off a bluff here on the river, but this is something that I mentioned before. River board pairs scare people. People do not like to bluff on river board pairs. So when he checks it over to me, I'm more than happy to check it back. And we close out the session picking off another bluff and winning a ton. We win $6,508 on the session. We have an $8,500 stack in a game that no one else has more than $2,900. Everything worked for us. It was just all systems go, all cylinders were clicking. It was just so nice, so fun. Obviously I ran great. I definitely don't want to take anything away from other players at the table. Hey, what's up guys? I'm in Sacramento at the Sacramento airport. You can probably see it behind me. I'm getting ready to board a flight to San Diego. It's Thursday. We played in the vloggers game last night and it went amazing. So going to be back in San Diego for two days. Then I'm heading to Vegas for the weekend. I'm probably going to play some low stakes poker in Vegas. I'm staying at the Caesars Palace, I believe. So probably going to play low stakes at the Caesars Palace. And then immediately after, I'm going to be taking a road trip with my dad to Arizona. Probably going to play some poker in Phoenix, play some poker in Tucson. So stay tuned on my Instagram for updates. And if I don't see you guys in Vegas, or Phoenix, or Tucson. I'll see you in a poker room near you. Take care.